morning, church. Let us go to prayer. Father, I come to you and I thank you for all that you do, for all that you've done. Father, I pray that we would see you as just the infinite power and the infinite majesty that you are this morning. Father, I pray that we would be changed by the songs we sing, the the verses we hear, the conversations that we have, uh, that we would leave here seeing and savoring you, Lord. I thank you for the many opportunities I got to see you work this week in the lives of our, our people, our, our members here, and those who are from other churches in the city praying against many things that displease you, Lord. I was thankful to see that. I was thankful to See so many people who are trusting in you in our church, even though they're in the midst of trials that they've never experienced um, hurt and pain. I got to sleep with them, Lord. I thank you for that. Lord, I just pray as every Sunday we come in here, Lord, that is, as Anthony said, that we are changed from glory to glory, that uh, we leave here understanding what we've heard, and that we've heard from you, and what you've called us to do. I pray that we would also reach out to our brothers and sisters who can't be here with us every Sunday. Um, though they listen online and they pray for us, Lord, they, they want to see us. I pray that we would find time to go see them and pray with them. Many who need healing, many who don't understand why God hasn't healed or what's, what's going on in their life and they're crying and they're begging out to you, Lord, and so I, I give you this prayer uh, to be with Highland Baptist Church, that we would be a people who are not too busy for that, are not too busy to hear you. And Lord, I pray for the city, pray for the city of the violent summer that we're having, that there would be peace, and that hearts would be changed. And Father, I pray for this message this morning that you would speak through me, that you would speak through your word. Lord. And I thank you that it is not me. I can't change anyone in here. All I can do is bring people to you, tell them about you. So Lord, please speak through me and through this text. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's try that again. How y'all doing? Good morning. All right? Yep. You good? So we finished the uh, book of Colossians last week. So I'm still seeking and searching and seeing which way we are, we are going next. Can you guys hear me? Pretty good? Yeah. Yes. That's not too loud, all right? And so in the midst of that, we're going to be, I guess for the rest of the summer, we're going to be looking at evangelism. We're going to be looking at evangelism. Uh, with Jesus uh, during this time and also during our Bible study, um, uh, looking to see how God moved and how the early church moved and, and so forth uh, as they reached out and pointed people to Jesus. And so I want you to, since we have a lot to talk about today, I want you to go to John, go ahead and jump into John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The title of my message today is Jesus is the One. We've been waiting for. And the big point I want you to leave it with here is that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. And salvation is granted to all who come in faith to the Savior who sought them first. Jesus is the one the world has been waiting for. And salvation is granted to all who come in faith to the Savior who sought us first. I want to give you a little background before we read. From all the, the people on the earth, God chooses Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation. And God chooses to make this nation his own people. He chooses to, to, to love this nation, protect this nation, and bless this nation. And yes, they were very blessed. God makes them conquerors. He does a lot of miracles in their midst to put fear in the hearts of other nations. And a Jewish kingdom is established. 
Now the Jews, they were to worship God from their heart and, and live in obedience towards him as an example to other nations. But the Jews continue to sin against God and follow other false gods. And so the Jewish kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So the temple, the, the center of religious life for the Jews, it's destroyed. And so, you know, watching the, the temple be destroyed, you can only imagine emotionally for the Jews how hard this must have been. It must have been like God was knocked off of his throne. They must have felt no hope. And many of the Jews were taken into captivity. Yet God, he continued to send prophets and he would remind the Jews of the promise that the Messiah was going to come, which means the anointed one, He'd come and he'd rescue them and he'd bring peace. And that hope was deep in their hearts. For centuries, mothers and fathers, they're tucking their children into bed, telling the story of Genesis 3.15, the promise of a coming Messiah that would make all things right. Uh, promises of 2 Samuel, uh, Samuel 7, where God makes a covenant between him and David. And, and that covenant says that God is going to bring the Messiah, or like set up his throne, a kingdom that will last forever. So this is... This is sketched in their hearts, in their, their DNA. They kept hoping. So now we get to the 5th century BC, and some of the Jews, they return to Jerusalem, and they, they start rebuilding the Jewish temple, and the, the Jews gained back their, their independence as a people. This was, this was very encouraging, because what this means is they're, you know, they're back in the graces of God, and also what this means is they're back on the path of the Messiah to come and make all things new. You know, there's so much hope again. But that joy was only for a moment because in the first century, Rome conquered the Jews, incorporated the territory of the ancient Jewish kingdom into their empire, and they came in fierce. This was, a, this was an army of no heart, much hurt, much death. And so how can you imagine how disheartening this was for the Jews? Uh, how could God let this happen? Uh, how, can he, how can he punish us Again, how can he punish us by Roman hands, those who do not worship you, Roman hands that worship other gods? And, and of course, where is the Messiah? Though they were defeated, the Jews, however, they never lost hope. That one day they would drive out the intruders and restore Jewish rule. They believed that God would intervene to change the course of history. And yes, he did. God kept his word. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to earth. And so Jesus, he, he starts his ministry at a time when this hope, there's this strong hope of a coming Messiah. There's a strong hope that meant we are waiting for the Messiah to come and make things right. And so that, he comes during a time, he starts his ministry during a time when the, the hope is, the Jewish hope is at the most high. And so when we get to our text here in, in, in chapter 1, verse 43, Jesus, he's been baptized already. Um, he's been baptized by John the Baptist. He's been tempted by Satan. Um, he's uh, been tempted by Satan and, and remains sinless. And right now when we jump in our text, he begins to pick his disciples. Let's read verse 43 through 44. My first point is Jesus found Philip. Jesus found Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So, so Philip, here we go right here, we have Philip who's from Bethsaida, a fishing village located in Galilee. Now Andrew and Peter, they're also from there, but they've somehow moved by the time we really get to see them, they move to Capernaum, so, but they are from the same city. Now, Jesus, he's in Jerusalem, and Galilee is about a three days' journey away. And so our text, I'm reading from the ESV, says, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. The, the NASB says, Jesus purposed to go into Galilee. And the New King James says, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. Jesus found Philip. Because Jesus was after Philip. Jesus wasn't randomly walking around finding people to join him. He could have found all 12 disciples right in Jerusalem and saved three days, but he goes after Philip. We see this urgency and decisive pursuit 
in the ministry of Jesus time and time again. In John 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. Here's where Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah to the Samaritan woman at the well. In Luke 19, 1 through 10, Jesus passed through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem in the cross for a, in the cross for a purpose to save Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a small man in a tree trying to see Jesus. Jesus is walking in the crowd and Jesus turns and he, and he says, hurry and come down, Zac Zacchaeus, calling him by name. I must stay in your house today. Zacchaeus is saved and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. See, Jesus, he purposed to go after the Samaritan woman, Zacchaeus, and Philip. Uh, later in our text, when we get to verse 45, Philip is going to say to Nathaniel, hey, we found Jesus. I think about my kids who are always losing something, daily losing something that they need, or something that belongs to me, and they will lose it. And very rarely can they find anything they've lost without the help of mom or dad. And it could be right in their face. My grandmother used to say, when I lose things, and it would be right in my face, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. Have you guys ever heard, you don't say that? You ever heard that? Well, use it. All right? If it was a snake, it would have bit you. It was right there. But some. But sometimes, so my kids are always losing stuff, but sometimes Tony and I, we will, we will find it and we would call them in and say, hey, we found this and we give it to them. And then they'll say, found it. <laughs> and we're like, all right, I actually had to correct uh, one of our, our kids because I heard them and they're giving a lecture on how they just went through all this work to find what was lost and how they need to uh, do better job of not losing things because they, and so I had to correct her and say, you didn't find that. Mom found that actually when that happened. You know, I think we still talk today like that about Jesus. Many of us say we found faith or we found God. But here's the reality. Jesus wasn't lost. We were. Amen. And here's the biblical description of mankind in our spiritual state. Listen to this. Colossians 1.21. Alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. So that means you're, you're separated from God, not just spiritually, but you're also separated physically. And so we're hostile towards God. So as Romans 1 says, when it talks about sin and how sin entered the world, it says in Romans 1 that we did not want to honor God and we do not want to be thankful towards God. Romans 5.10 says we are enemies of God. 1 Corinthians 12.14 says the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So here's what that means. In our natural state, we can't discern the things of God. Nor do we want to. We consider it foolish, all the preaching, all the singing, all the going to church. Why can't we just do what we want to do? Why do we have to do this? Why do we need to be saved? This is how we think. We can't discern the spiritual things of God. I'm going to keep going. Titus 3 says we're foolish, we're disobedient, we're led astray. And get this, we're slaves to various passions and pleasures. So we are pursuing pa passions and pleasures. Is that not every single person you've ever met in your life? Even those before they come to Christ? Even you, if you're a Christian here today, was that not you seeking pleasure and passions going your own way? So after I've said all that, none of that sounds like someone who is looking for God, looking for a God to submit to, or even a desire to want to submit to God. Right. So this is why John says in the beginning of the chapter, John 1.11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Jesus, he comes to his own people, the Jews, who are actually even waiting for a Messiah. If anyone was going to jump on board with Jesus Christ, it would have been the Jews. But they did not receive him. They rejected the one that they've been waiting for. And here's why. They were driven by their passions and their, their pleasures of seeing a Jewish rule. You see, they didn't want a Messiah. They wanted the benefits. They loved the cookouts. 
They loved when he, you know, they loved when he did the miracles. They loved the healings. But whenever he started to talk about full obedience to God, whenever he started to talk about forgiving the Romans, forgiving your enemies, Jesus didn't sound like a conqueror who came to destroy the Romans anymore. And so they rejected him. You know, Jesus tells a parable about sowing the seed and how the seed falls in the lives of certain people. And we learn sometimes that a person, they hear the word of God, and, or they say they're looking for God. They're really looking for, they're really looking for God, looking for God. But what we come to find out, and this is Jesus speaking, that some people are just looking for an escape out of a situation. They're looking for an escape out of a trial of the cares of this world. And so they receive the word with joy. But when life hits them again, when they face persecution because they're rolling with Jesus now, they walk away. You see, coming to God and seeing Jesus as the Son of God, the, to actually submit to him in his lordship is a supernatural act of God. There was nothing special about Philip or the disciples. They were no different from us. They were driven by passions. They weren't smarter than the next man or the next Jew. They weren't holier than the next Jew. But here's the universal truth about mankind. Mankind rejects God and Jesus pursues us. Mankind rejects God and Jesus still pursues us. God's will to have a people will not be stopped by our spiritual depravity or the works of the devil. Jesus tells Philip and the disciples later, John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he should give it to you. Check out John 10, 25 through 30. Everyone's asking Jesus, just say it plainly. Are you the Messiah? Yes or no? And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you were not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So it's clear that Jesus found Philip. And if you know Jesus Christ, he found you too. Amen. Aren't, why is this good news that should be celebrated? Aren't you glad you serve a God who pursues even while you are an enemy? Amen. Aren't you glad that he became flesh and dwelt among us, lived with us, and still pursued us, even though we reject him? Get this, are you, are you filled with joy that he pursues you and gives you what you do not deserve? which is eternal life, which means he knows you. You go from being an enemy to an heir of Jesus Christ when you were an enemy. And you can feel the love of a sovereign God, the good shepherd that he is, that he says he protects us from the schemes of the devil. No one can steal us from him. You will never perish if you receive him. So there's many blessings and, and encouragement and the truth that God pursues us and still pursuing us. So now, now what do now what does Jesus mean by receive Jesus, or, or what do I mean by rejecting Jesus? Well, I don't. John talks about this right in the beginning of the chapter. I want you to understand this. John 1, 12 to thirteen. But to him, all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I like how John MacArthur says that salvation is a paradox. Salvation is a divine act that demands a human response. I want you to get that in your head. Salvation is a divine act that demands a human response. So we are saved by grace through faith. Saved by grace, divine act. Through faith, you must receive him. If you believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and he paid for your sins and you confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, this is how you receive him. Believe in him. Receive him. Believe in him. You see, the sovereignty of God 
and the, the human responsibility to receive Christ are not doctrines to fight over, sides to choose, but both truths to be received by all Christians. And it's so funny, we sing all these songs all the time that speak of God changing us. God, God changing, we're going one direction and we go another. But because we are, our hearts are hard and we have humility, the fact that God would make us receive him, no, I chose Christ. I was smart enough. You, you see what I'm saying? We need to humble ourselves. I, I think about all the times where, that we walk past people because they haven't done something that we feel they're going to reject Christ or there's something in their life that we don't think that we should witness to him. They're not going to receive God. We have all this stuff and we totally forget about our salvation, about how we were saved, how God pursued us, how he didn't wait for us to clean up our lives, and so forth. Man, I'm thankful God didn't wait for me to make that decision. Amen. All right? Now we're going to see this play out in this salvation story in our text. Next we see Philip finds Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel. So Philip found Nathaniel when he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So verse 46, Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and see. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, Nathaniel, he's known by another <coughs> Bartholomew. He's called Bartholomew in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John. So Nathaniel's from Cana, so a town in Galilee, close to Nazareth. So Philip goes after Nathaniel and says, We have found the Messiah, the Anointed One, that Moses and in the law and the prophets wrote about. So when you see that phrase, and you'll probably see it a lot when you read the New, uh, the New Testament, um, um, the Moses and the prophets, uh, and the law of the prophets, and sometimes Jesus would say in the scriptures, and Paul would say, preach the word. Well, we know that the New Testament wasn't completed. We didn't have a full canon. So what they're talking about is the Old Testament. The Bible is 66 books telling one story. The story of the faithful servant of God, Jesus, who reconciles the world to himself. And Jesus would tell them all the time, the scriptures speak of me. Look at John 5, 39 through 40. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. In John 5, 46, he says, but if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote of me. And so as I, as I said in the introduction, the Jews, they never gave up hope in the coming Messiah, even if it was for the wrong reasons. And so Philip says to Nathaniel, the Messiah is here, the one we've all been waiting for is here, and Nathaniel responds, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why do you think that was his response? I always ask you guys questions, and for some weird reason, I think you're going to say something back to me. <laughs> and I don't know if I want you to say something back to me, to be honest with you. This is, just a, this is a weird situation that keeps happening. But um, let's just keep moving on. So I'm going to tell you why, all right? I'm going to give you two possible reasons why this happened. Um, number one, Nathaniel was from Cana. That's about three miles from Nazareth. And so there's believed to be some issues between the folk of Cana and the folk of Nazareth. Um, some sodoms, I don't know. There's some issues there. So maybe the dislike Nathaniel has for Nazarenes is just, it's, it's, it's uh, too much for him to, to think that the Messiah would come from a place like that. That's one reason. Or number two, the fact that Nazareth is just a small, just unimportant city. It's not even mentioned in any of the Old Testament writings that deal with the Messiah. And that's debatable. But a clear Nazareth and talking about the Messiah, you, have to, you don't see that, even though you can find it if you um, kind of look at some things. But nevertheless, maybe that's why he doesn't believe that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. So, well, which one is it? Maybe Nathaniel doesn't like Nazarenes. Maybe he doesn't. And I, we'll never know until we, we see him. But our text will help us see that the real reason for, for responding like he did was because he had honest disbelief that the Messiah had come. And not only that, that he was from Nazareth. So Nathaniel, he is a man of the book. He's, a, he's expecting the Messiah to come. He may have been sitting under the fig tree reading the scriptures. 
And Jesus said that they was an Israelite indeed in whom there was no deceit. So Jesus is not saying that Nathaniel is a man of no sin. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, not seek and save the righteous. So Nathaniel was not sinless. So what that term deceit means in its context is that Nathaniel, he, he did not speak deceitfully. He didn't have a tongue of trickery. He was honest and sincere when he said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? 